Well, hey, everybody. If you're watching this, that means we had a snow day. That means that we had to uh, do church via Zoom. So I wanted to come up here and record this message so that we would have a message for Sunday. I, I, I do believe I have a, a really important message to share, so I, I want to share that. Um, and so anyway, just, uh, just before I get started, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have been wondering, okay, how's Brian doing? And, um, you know, because uh, Georgia won the national championship after 41 years. Um, that is a long, long time where we have heard our rivals say, you know, you know, Georgia hasn't won a championship in 41 years, and um, you know, back then Ronald Reagan was president, and that's when the Rubik's Cube was invented, and that's when uh, the U.S. defeated the uh, Soviet Union in hockey. And so anyway, we finally, finally did it, and I could not be more happy. Um, I, I just, it's, it was, it's been an incredible, it was incredible, it was incredible. 41 years of heartbreak, heartache. Uh, just anyway, so super excited. So just wanted to say that because I know people are wondering, and so I just wanted to share. It was it's been a very very great week. So anyway, that is not the message, but um, I do believe I have a a very important message to share that um, has been on my heart as we enter into 2022. Um, and I, obviously, we were in quarantine for two weeks and stuff like that, so I haven't been able to share it. But it's a message that I believe is. Um, a prophetic message. When I go into a new year, I like to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what are you speaking as we head into a new year? I don't really, I don't really try to get like some of these guys try to get like a prediction or whatever. You know, I, these things are going to happen in 2022. I like to come in and say, Lord, what are you speaking as we head into 2022? And so I'm going to deliver that message um, and just to be honest, Angie is the, my wife is the one who uh, was the originator of this. This is the beginning of, she, she planted the seed for this message because um, she, she felt like God was speaking to her out of Matthew 17, the transfiguration. And when she shared it, I was like, oh, that's really good. And as I started meditating on it, I was like, oh, that's really good. And that, that's where the, this message comes from. But I do believe this is a prophetic word. It is what I, I believe the Lord wants to speak to the church as we head into a new year from Matthew 17, from the transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. And uh, there's eight things that um, I want to share from that that I believe pertain to the, uh, is what I think God wants to speak to the church as we head into this new year. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 16. And I want to speak from, from, this, the, from the transfiguration of Jesus Christ and, and all that. So uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, and, 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 and you know, the, the transfiguration actually takes place in Matthew 17, but in Matthew 16, it, it's very interesting. I want you to observe this in Matthew 17 or Matthew 16, um, that the, the Lord is, is talking about taking up your cross and his second coming and things like that. And down at the end of the chapter in verse 27, um, the Lord talks about the second coming and he says, for the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will repay every man according to his deeds. And then verse 28, it's one of those things that theologians and scholars have said, like, what is he talking about? What does he mean? But the Lord says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so sometimes people think that means some of the people there would not die until Jesus came back. But actually what the Lord's talking about is the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 17, is there would be some, and that we know who those are, Peter, James, and John, who would allow, who the Lord would permit to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. And that's really the theme of this message is, if we want to be unshakable as we enter into a new year, if we want to be unshakable as we progress through this decade of decades, we see we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, 
But the question is, even though we're receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, are we individually being shaken by what's going on? See, the Lord promised in Hebrews chapter Chapter 12, he said, Yet once more I will shake everything that can be shaken, so that what remains is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And the question, though, is, is when God is shaking things, and we will see an increase of the shakings of the Lord as we head into the decade of the 2020s, as things are being shaken, the question would be, are we unshakable? And you see, the Lord wants us to be unshakable. The Lord wants us to be immovable. Isaiah 33 talks about the Lord is the stability of your times. See, we're moving into a time in history where if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then we are going to be unstable and shakable as things around us are shaking. And God does not want us to be shaken by these things. God does not want us to be affected by these things. He wants to be the stability of our times. He wants to be the, the foundation that we rest upon. He wants our trust to be in him so that our, in, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we would be unmovable, unshakable. We would not be phased by what's breaking out in the earth, whatever it would happen, whatever it would come. As you know, everything is being shaken. The economic systems, governments, the church, culture. I mean, we're, we, are, we are living in a time when, when great shaking is taking place, but God wants his people to be unshakable. And for us to be unshakable, this is what I believe the Lord spoke to me as we were entering this new year, is if we want to be unshakable, then we must see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. I just want just us to think about this for a second. Is the Lord wants to show us the revelation of Jesus Christ coming in his kingdom. When I'm talking about coming in his kingdom, I mean literally the second coming of Jesus Christ. That we would see this in advance before it takes place so that in seeing this, we internally would not be shaken. We would have the hope of his glorious coming. We would have the hope of his second coming. And that we would have peace inwardly. We would be people of, of stability and peace and hope. And like Dad talked about last Sunday, is that we would not have anxiety and we would not have fear because we would be rooted and grounded in Christ at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so... As we enter this 2022, as we go further into 2022, the Lord wants us to be unshakable by seeing the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. That's exactly what John and Peter and, uh, and James were able to do. John, Peter, and James were able to do. They saw the Son of Man. I may have said Paul earlier if I did. <laughs> well, obviously it wasn't Paul. He wasn't even saved at this time. But Peter, James, and John, they, they, see, they are permitted to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. So that's kind of the theme of this message. And so, you know, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the transfiguration and all that happened is the Lord, six days later, takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up to the mountain of transfiguration, and they're here as, as Jesus is being unveiled and all of a sudden Jesus is transfigured and his face becomes like the sun shining in its strength. And, you know, you, you, you know the story, but they're, they're filled with fear and the fear of God comes on them and the Lord picks them up and says, don't be afraid. And as they're, as they're here in this transfiguration, Elijah and Moses appear and begin to talk to Jesus and Peter, who's always outspoken, you know, he says, Lord, can we not make a tabernacle here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? And then the, the, there comes this cloud that comes over them, and it, and it actually says in Luke's version, it overshadows them. And in overshadowing them, it's almost as if, as if the father was saying, Peter, please be quiet. I want you to listen to my son. And, and so that's kind of what was taking place. And then when the whole experience was over, they looked up and they saw no one but Jesus. 
And so I believe this, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot in this that I think God is wanting to highlight to the church as we enter a new year. And I'm, I got eight things here I want to talk about is the first thing I, I want to say is number one, as I believe as we enter this new year, God is calling us to be alone with him. God is calling us to be alone with him. See, it was Peter, James, and John. He took Peter, James, and John. He took no one else. He took them to the mountain of transfiguration. There is a, there is a call of God upon the church right now calling us to be alone with him, calling us to be in this secret place relationship with him where we know him in the secret place. We are intimate with him. We commune with him. We dine with him. We have fellowship, spirit to spirit fellowship with him. He's calling us to be alone with him, to know him in the secret place, to turn off some of the distractions. I mean, there are so many distractions in this life we live in, and especially with social media and YouTube and all these things. There's so much to watch and so many things to look at. Just It's like, you know, turn down the volume of some things and turn down some of the distraction and be alone with him. It's very important that we build our relationship with him. The Lord is the stability of our times, but if we don't have a relationship with him, and I, I mean, I don't mean that you're not saved. I don't, I, what I'm talking about is you don't have this deep, intimate, communing, dining, friendship, relationship with you where you commune in conversational intimacy, where you hear his voice and you share your heart. He shares your heart. If you don't have that, then we're going to be easily shakable in the times we live in. And God doesn't want us to be that way. So developing that secret place relationship, being alone with the Lord. The second thing is, and I've kind of hit on this, already is that, that we need to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. And it, it's interesting, really, when the Lord says in Matthew 16, 28, he says, there's some of you standing here that are not going to taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so he was, he was telling them, okay, you're going you're gonna to get a appetizer of what it's really like when he comes. You're going to get a foretaste, a, an experience, an appetizer of what it's going to be like. And so Matthew 17, 1 says, this is really interesting, six days later. Now, if you're familiar with, with prophecy and you're familiar with scholarship, a lot of scholars say, think that the six days of creation are like 6,000 years of history from Adam. And that, and that on the seventh day is when Jesus will come at the end of the sixth day. And on the seventh day, he'll establish the 1,000-year reign, which is like the seventh day of creation when God rested. And it's inter interesting here, when the disciples are promised to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, it's six days later that Jesus is revealed. See, they're getting a foretaste of his coming in power and in glory. They're getting a foretaste of what it's like to see the Son of Man coming with power and glory. And it's six days later. It's also interesting. I started thinking about this transfiguration. I started comparing it to the book of Revelation. And the parallels are actually really striking. For example, um, the, the three apostles get a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's transfigured before them. Well, John also gets a revelation of Jesus Christ, and the Father reveals Jesus to him in a way he's never seen him, in such a way that John the Apostle was struck with fear, in such a way John, the one whom Jesus loved, the one whom John, he laid his head on the heart of Jesus to hear his heartbeat. And, and, and now the Lord comes to him and reveals to John, this is who I am. He's like, I never knew you were like this. And it brought terror and fear into John. You look at the second thing is his face. It shined like the sun in, in the transfiguration. And we know in the book of Revelation, Jesus is revealed to John. And his face is shining like the sun in his strength. Then the next thing we see is Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, where you know in the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses whom most scholars believe are Moses and Elijah, they preach and they prophesy for three and a half years in Jerusalem. 
The next thing that's interesting about this, the next parallel is, and this is really crazy, is the church or the, the apostles, it says, and they're having this encounter with the Lord, but they, uh, they came into under a deep sleep. And I'm like, how could you possibly fall asleep when the Son of Man is being revealed to you like this? How could you possibly fall asleep? It's just crazy. But it parallels the church before the Lord comes being sound asleep. The next thing you see is the Father interrupts everything and he says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And we know that also the, the, churches, the seven churches of Revelation were exhorted to listen to Jesus. He who, has a, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then the next thing we see is that the revelation of Christ brought a fear of God upon the apostles. And, and it says explicitly in the text that when he, was when he was revealed, when he was transfigured before him, fear came on them. And we know when John saw Christ that the fear of God came on him and he fell down like a dead man and and, and he, the Lord picked him up, just like he picked up the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration and said, don't be afraid. Is the fear of the Lord removes all other fears. And so one, one, one thing that's been on my heart, and I just, I've kept saying it a lot, is Revelation 4.1, the Lord is inviting us, come up here, come up here, and I will show you what must soon take place. Now, that, that, I believe that is an invitation to the church as we enter into 2022 is the Lord wants to give us a revelation of the Son of Man coming in His kingdom before He comes in His kingdom. And so I want to encourage us, really the, the, the main way we get a revelation of the Son of Man coming in His kingdom before He comes in His kingdom is to read the book of Revelation. And so there are so many different ideas about the book of Revelation and so many people just, all they think the book of Revelation is is this really scary book and there's all these bad things that happen and if I read this book, I'm going to get depressed and I'm going to be over overwhelmed with fear and all these negative emotions are going to come up and that's actually, it's really strange. When you read the book of Revelation in a spirit of prayer, out of intimacy with the Lord to get a revelation of Jesus Christ, what actually happens is the exact opposite. I found this to be true. What, what happens is you actually get boldness and courage and strength and hope for the times we live in as we approach into the age. So it actually is the opposite of what we think would happen. And so I believe the Lord is, is just encouraging the end time church, encouraging us in 2022, read the book of Revelation. It is indispensable. The book of Revelation is indispensable. If we want to be unshakable as we head into this decade, as we head into this new year, reading the book of Revelation is indispensable. There's, there's no other book like it, in my opinion, in Scripture. And so I want to encourage you and even challenge you to read this book. Now, if you are afraid of this book, and you don't like this book, I want to challenge you. I want, to, I want you to, I want to just confront, you need to confront that fear. Confront that fear. If, you have a, if you're afraid, if you're timid of reading that book from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22, confront that fear and read it and overcome your fear because I think the Lord will meet you in that. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of like the movie the Matrix, if you saw the movie The Matrix, where there, he's offered the red pill or the blue pill. If you take the red pill, you're going to see things as they really are. It's going to really unsettle you, but you're not going to live in an illusion anymore. But if you take the blue pill, you're going to have this ignorance is bliss reality, but you're going to be a slave to the system. It's kind of like reading the book of Revelation. It's almost like we take the red pill and our eyes are open to see, okay, this is where human history is headed but, you know, it's, you know, even though it's a little bit disruptive, even though it's a little bit uncomfortable, even though it shakes us a little bit, even though it's like, oh, man, it disrupts our fairy tale image of what life is like, 
We're no, we're, it, it frees us from the world system because we see every, all of these kingdoms of man are going to crumble until they become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So I just want to say, read the book of Revelation in 2022. The third thing that, that is on my heart is or what we see from this experience is Luke 9.32, is, it talks about Peter and the, two, the other two disciples. It says they were overcome with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And again, I mentioned that a minute ago, but how could they possibly be asleep? I mean, how could these guys, they're, they're, they're literally seeing the Son of God transfigured before them and shining in the brightness of glory and the brightness of light, and they fall asleep, okay? If you ever needed encouragement, that should really encourage us. I mean, these great men of God in the, in the most glorious time of encounter were falling asleep. And I think it speaks to where the church is right now. The church is sound asleep. So many, so few in the church really understand the times we live in. So few in the, in the church really understand the times we live in. We live in the days of Noah. We live, the, the, Jesus himself said that the coming of the Son of Man would be like the days of Noah. And so if you study the days of Noah, you realize that the days of Noah began when the Lord said that I am no longer going to strive with man forever, and his days shall be 120. That doesn't mean that after the flood that we're going to live to be 120. It means from that prophetic announcement, God was counting down 120 years. Let's say days. 120 years after that prophetic announcement that then the flood would come in 120 years. And you know what, what the Lord said. It's like, you know, when before the coming of the Son of Man, they're going to be eating and drinking, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, building and planting, buying and selling. They're going to be carrying on life as usual. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. That what the Lord's hitting at is this, this uh, sleepiness, this attitude of not knowing the times we live in, this this feeling of not really discerning the seasons we live in, and the Lord's hitting at that and saying that they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. But God does not want the church to be asleep. God wants the church to wake up. Wake up to the reality of the times we live in. See, you are living in the days when the book of Revelation are being fulfilled right before your eyes. I'm not saying God, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I'm not saying any of that. But we are living in the days when end time prophecy is being unfolded right before our eyes. And so we need to wake up. And so the good news is they're, they're, that when the disciples woke up, they beheld his glory. And the end time church, you know, it talks about in Matthew 25 that, that all of them fell asleep, but their five wise virgins really woke up and they had, you know, fought against the sleepiness for many, many years and they had oil and they immediately turned their lamps on. And it's going to be a symbol, symbolism of the remnant. When the remnant fully wakes up, they're going to see Jesus in his glory. The fourth thing, I think the fourth thing that that we see here in this transfiguration is that, is that we need to seek an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, when we look at the transfiguration, the disciples saw Christ and he was transfigured before him. And, and the light of God, the, the Son of God was transfigured in glory. And so most of us are never, you know, this side of heaven are never going to have that kind of an encounter with the Lord. Some might but most are not going to have that level of an encounter with Jesus. But you know what? We can have an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. You can have an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. See, God wants to, Ephesians 1, 17 through 18, that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. God would give you a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation that you might know him. 
That word know in the Greek is a really, it's a really interesting word. It means that you might come into a full, precise, true knowledge that comes by relational experience. That's what it means in the Greek. You can look it up. This word means that God might give you a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation so that you might come to a full, precise, exact knowledge of Jesus Christ that comes by experiential relationship. It pretty, that's the invitation to us. Just like when, when Paul went into the wilderness for three years or however long it was, he went into the wilderness for three years and he said in Galatians chapter 1, God was pleased to reveal his son in me. I believe the Lord is offering the church as we enter this new, this new year is the Father wants to reveal his son in you. God wants to give you a revelation of Jesus Christ that takes place in your human spirit. Now, if you get an, ex, if you get an external revelation then that's awesome. But don't discount the revelation of Jesus Christ that comes internally. I'm talking about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where it says, God who spoke light into darkness is the one who is shown into our hearts to give the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, God the Father wants to reveal the beauty and the glory of his Son to you internally that you might know him. Now, this kind of revelation I'm talking about, the revelation of Jesus Christ, it does not come to everyone. If you're half-hearted, if you're lukewarm, then you're not going to get a revelation of Jesus Christ. The Father is not going to reveal his Son to you if you're half-hearted. The only the hungry get a revelation of Jesus Christ. See, if you think about it, God winnowed down, even among the 12, he winnowed it down to three, and only three were permitted to, to have that experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Only three were permitted to have that revelation. And it's the hungry, it's those who are hungry that the Father will give the revelation of his Son. And so I just want, I want to challenge us here just for a minute is it so easy with so much going on, so much distraction, so much noise, so much activity, so much busyness. It's so easy that we just, we just uh, it, it begins to affect our heart and we begin to grow dull and we begin to grow lukewarm and we begin to become self-satisfied and that hunger that we once had, that first love we had, that driving desire we had, it begins to dissipate. It begins to wane. It begins to grow cold. We don't even realize it. Imperceptibly, it's happening and it's growing cold and cool. And we're not even realizing our hearts are, are falling away from the Lord and we're growing lukewarm. See, the Lord will only give the hungry a revelation of Jesus. If you're not hungry, if you're not hungry for Jesus, He's not going to reveal himself to you. See, if you're lukewarm, if you're satisfied, if you're content, if the status quo is good enough for you, if you're, if you're just kind of like, okay, well, if he gives it to me, that's good, but if not, that's fine. You'll never get a revelation of Jesus Christ. You've got to be hungry. You've got to have a desire. You've got to yearn and thirst for him. And if you do, he will reveal Jesus to you. So I encourage you as we enter this new year, if you are lukewarm, if your love is growing cold, if you have been distracted by a million things and the hunger is not there, ask the Lord to give you a, a fresh stirring of hunger. Ask the Lord to give you a fresh hunger for him, a hunger like you've never had before. See, if you think about it, the Lord had his 70. His 70 went out and did ministry for Jesus. This is kind of like the outer court. They worked for God. 
Then the Lord had his 12. The 12 knew the Lord a much lot deeper than the 70. That's kind of like the holy place. But then there was the three, Peter, James, and John. That's like the holy of holies. They had a deeper, more uh, richer experience of intimacy with Jesus. And then finally, the, of all the three, there was one, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the intimate the beloved, the one who leaned his head on the heart of Jesus Christ. He was closer to Jesus than any of the other apostles. And, and Jesus is the one who chose John. And in fact, in John chapter 21, he said, Peter's like, a, you know, the Lord tells Peter, this is how you're going to die. And Peter looks, okay, what about him? Talk, talking to John, talking about John. And the Lord says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Well, that is almost the exact language we see in Matthew 16. And I believe the Lord was setting John apart for an even greater revelation of his coming, which is the book of Revelation. See, if you hunger for the Lord, you will have a much deeper revelation of him. Don't allow lukewarmness and apathy to damper your hunger, to quench your hunger, to satisfy you. Hunger for him like you've never hungered before. The fifth thing is that the father, the father's pleasure is in his son. You think about it like Peter, when he saw the revelation of Jesus Christ and he saw Peter, or he saw Moses and Elijah appearing. Peter gave the response that so much of the church would give. Lord, let me make a tabernacle for you. Let me build something of worth to the kingdom of God. Lord, let me do something for you. Let me capitalize upon this prophetic revelation and build something. That's like so much of the church is. We get, we get this prophetic revelation. We get this prophetic insight. We get a, a, something God shows us, and we want to build a platform upon it for ourselves. We get this revelation, we get this insight, and we want to monopolize it and get something out of it for us, even though we put Jesus' name on it, but we want to get something for us. Glory, fame, money, a platform, influence. And I believe the Lord would say to the church, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. God wants, the Father wants to bring us back to the one thing that has satisfied his heart for all eternity, and that is, his, that is his son. It's so interesting, if you read it in Luke's account in Luke 9, 34, while Peter was saying, let me build this for you, let me do this for you, let me do some kingdom activity, let me do some kingdom work, the father comes in with a cloud, and it says he overshadowed them all. God wants to overshadow every other name except his son. All the famous bands and brands and all the famous ministers and all those with names, we got to hear what this person's saying, that person's saying. The, Lord, the Father is like, I am overshadowing all of the other voices except my son, that you might hear him, that God would bring us back to that pleasure that the Father has in his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. May we come in this new year to find the pleasure that God the Father has in his son. May we find that in our own relationship with him. May we find that in our own relationship with Jesus Christ. The pleasure that is burned in the Father's heart since before time and creation, that pleasure of God and his Son, may it burn in our hearts. May we drink from the river of God's pleasures. Like it says in Psalms 36, the pleasures of God that are in his Son. I love it. I love it. I love it. The Father is so jealous for his Son that he overshadows Moses, Elijah, and the famous apostles. He overshadows them all. And he brings us to number six, the sixth point. Listen to Jesus. The Father says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. 
May the Lord silence every other voice until we go to the Lord for ourselves. I mean, how often do we run to say, okay, what is this person saying? What is that person saying? Now, don't get me wrong. That's not bad. The problem is if we're running to them first before we're going to the Lord. You can hear God for yourself. You don't have to run here, there, and everywhere to hear what the latest apostle or prophet is saying. Now, there are times we definitely need to hear what God is speaking to other people, for sure. Absolutely. But the Lord is saying to us, the Lord is saying to you, this is my beloved son. You listen to him. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 talks about God in the past has spoken to us in many portions and in many ways, but in, this last, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. Gee, the, the father is saying to the church, listen to my son. Listen to my son. One of the things that was on my heart as I was preparing this message is I felt like the Lord was, the Lord just gave me this word for some. Is they're kind of like, okay, what do I focus on in 2022? What do I, you know, in, in, do I read through the Bible? Do I read through a book in the Bible? And I just felt like the Lord is going to call some who would hear this message to focus on the words in red in 2022. Focus on the words in red in 22. Focus on the words of Jesus in 2022. Spend a year, or maybe it doesn't take you that long, but just go through slowly searching the Lord's words in red. And, and so I, I do believe that's a, a word to some that God is calling you to read the words in red. Listen to my son. Now, obviously that refers to listening to his word in the Bible, the scriptures, but also, in our own relationship with the Lord, Jesus invited us to dine with him. Jesus invited us to know him. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The, Lord wants to, the Lord's inviting us into this dining, communing, conversational relationship with Jesus Christ where we would know him intimately. Just like two people sitting together over dinner where they're you know, when you're eating with somebody, you're open, you're honest, you're talking about things. You share your heart, they share their heart, and you have this bond that happens over food. That's, the, that's like what the Lord is speaking in Revelation chapter 3. Dine with me. I want to have conversational intimacy. I want to share my heart with you. I want you to share your heart with me. I want you to know me, and I want to hear, I want to know you in the secret place. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not only are we to listen to him as it relates to our relationship, relational intimacy, communing, conversations, listening, uh, writing down what he's speaking, but I, I think this is really, really important. We're living in a day and an hour where we cannot operate based on human wisdom alone. See, so many Christians today are making decisions based solely on human wisdom and fear. You can't make a decision in the times we live in based on human emotion, human reasoning, or fear, especially fear. See, a lot of people are being tested right now with different choices they have to make. Should I do this? Should I do that? And if fear is driving you to make a decision, pull back, stop, and say, Lord, what are you saying? What are you speaking? And don't just assume by human reasoning that the choice is right. See, we're living in a day and an hour where God is speaking and God's voice opposes human reasoning. God's voice, the Lord says in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are, are not your thoughts. To assume that what you think is what God thinks is presumption. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. If you just run out and presume that this is what you're supposed to do without inquiry of God, then you can, you can fall into some serious trouble. 
So that's the hour we live in. We've got to hear the Lord's voice. We've got to do what the Lord is saying. We have got to really say, okay, what are you speaking, Lord? What are you saying? Number seven, this is a really important one. This is building on what Dad talked about in his message last Sunday is that we are to fear God alone. And so you know in Matthew 17, the transfiguration is taking place. And, and when and you, just, you just can imagine this a father interrupts Peter in his building activities. And he, I mean, you can just imagine it was like a voice of thunder. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And, and when they heard the, set, the audible voice of God, the fear of God came on all of them and they fell down. It's just like what John experienced on the Isle of Patmos when he saw his beloved friend revealed to him and the fear of God came upon him. Isaiah 8 says that you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of what they are in dread of. But it is the Lord of hosts whom you should fear. And he shall be your dread and he shall be your fear. We're not to fear what the world fears. We're not to be afraid of what the world is afraid of. I mean, there's, there's, there's um, obvious reasons in the times we live in for fear to grip the hearts of people. In fact, Jesus said that, that talking about the end times, is that men's hearts are going to faint because of fear. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety out there, a lot of things that can make us fear. But did you know when we fear God, it drives away every other fear. See, God wants us, like Dad's message last Sunday, God wants us to fear God and no one else. He wants us to fear the Lord, that the, that the spirit of the fear of the Lord might rest on us. I've taught on the end times for many years, and I always look at the response of people. And if you've taught on the end times, you can probably relate to this. But I, I kind of narrowed it down as like when when people when people hear the message of the end times, they they respond to this subject like some type of a bird. And let me explain what I mean. Some people hear the message, and they resp respond like an ostrich. They just want to bury their head in the sand and say, don't speak to me. Don't tell me about these things that are taking place. I would rather not know. Ignorance is bliss. Don't respond like an ostrich. Other, others respond like a turkey. They become a coward and they shrink back from doing the right thing and being a faithful witness in obedience to the Lord. See, in these times we live in, God needs bold and faithful witnesses. Don't be a turkey. Don't be a coward. Others become a chicken. They're overcome with fear, anxiety, panic, and they're like just so, just so um, nervous and anxious about the times we live in. See, we, you were born. God knew you would be born at such a time as this. He, he appointed you for this hour. We're meant to be strong and courageous. God wants us to be strong and courageous. He doesn't want us to bury our head in the sand or be a turkey or, or be a chicken. And the, the other response, I, I would say, is like a bird. Is some want to shoot a bird. And you know what I mean, the hand gesture. If you're, I don't know if you have this in other countries, but in America, I won't do it. But in America, if you, you basically put out your middle finger and it's called shooting a bird, that means you've offended me. And so sometimes when people hear the message about the end times, they want to shoot a bird to the messenger. They get offended. They get offended that you would even bring it up. They would get offended that you would confront their comfort. They get offended that you would actually talk about some of these things that Jesus talked about. I just want to say, don't get offended. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended at me. See, the Lord wants us to understand these things, to know these things that are coming, to know the times we live in, to know the hour we live in. So don't get offended. And then finally, I want to turn to Isaiah here. Isaiah chapter 40. This is the, 
the last bird response we need. This is the one we need. Isaiah 40, verse 13, is the eagle. God wants us in these end times to be eagles. He doesn't want us to be any other type of bird but an eagle. And, and Isaiah 40, 13 talks about waiting on the Lord. Uh, or actually, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. See, the, the eagle has perspective. The eagle sees. The eagle understands God's prophetic perspective. The eagle is strong and soars high above the circumstances. The eagle is looking down upon it. The eagle is like Revelation 4.1. Come up here and see what is going to take place. God wants us to be like an eagle. God wants us to have perspective. God wants us to have prophetic insight. To come up here and be like an eagle. So the point is this. In the times we live in, and this hour we live in, it, the, the, the Lord wants to bring back the fear of God into his church. The Lord wants to bring back the fear of God into his church. That doesn't mean we're afraid of God. That doesn't mean we run away from God. It means that, that the revelation of him just drives away all other fears, that we don't want to we don't want to do anything that would offend him. We don't want to do anything that would displease him. We want to please him. Like Paul talked about, we knowing, he actually called it, knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, and we want to be found pleasing to him. When the fear of the Lord comes, you don't want to do anything except what he's doing, anything except what he's saying that God would release the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that the spirit of the fear of the Lord would come on us and we would fear him and nothing else and no one else. May the fear of the Lord come on our hearts in such a way that it would drive away every other fear and make us like an eagle that soars above the circumstances, not burying our heads because we don't want to hear the truth, not being a coward who runs away when conflict comes, not being a chicken who panics in his fear and has anxiety about those things, not shooting a bird because we're offended at what's being spoken, but being an eagle, an eagle that soars above the circumstances and sees with God's eyes what is about to take place. And then finally, number eight, Matthew 17, 18 is when this whole experience was done, I love this, is they lifted up their eyes and they saw no one except Jesus himself. As we head into this new year, and I know my message is a little bit late because we were in quarantine, but as we head into this new year of 2022, may our eyes see Jesus and no one else. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, fix your eyes on Jesus. Run the race that is set before you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. So as we wrap this up, that is my exhortation to you is everything is going to be summed up in Jesus Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth will be summed up in him. Everything is coming under his headship, under his lordship. His, his kingdom is coming. The king is coming. And as we head into this new year, let our hearts come under his lordship, his kingship, like never before, that we would see him and him alone. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, I just pray right now Lord, that you would give us, Lord, I, I just pray right now that just these eight things, that you would draw us into a secret place relationship with you. Just where you're at, listen right now. Just ask the Lord. Just take a second and say, Lord, draw me after you. I want to spend that time in that secret place with you.
I want to be alone with you and, and seek you and know you. Lord, I, number two is, Lord, I pray that you would give me a revelation of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. Just ask the Lord for that. A revelation of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before he comes in his kingdom. Number three is, Lord, I just pray that you would wake me up. Lord, wake me up. Lord, wake me up to the hour we live in. Lord, break off the spirit of slumber, the spirit of stupor that would cause me not to see, not to hear, that would cause me not to understand. Break off that stupor, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Number four, God, would you give me a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation? Just, just pray that right now. Father, would you give me a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation that I might come to know Jesus Christ in a much more full, rich, precise way through experiential relational knowledge? Number five, Lord, would you give me, would you allow me to come into this pleasure that you have in your son? Lord, the, the very pleasure you have in your son, would you bring me into your pleasure? The same love, Father, that you have for your son, would you put that love in me? Number six, Lord, let me hear your voice. Father, let us hear your voice. Just ask the Lord, let me hear your voice. Let me hear your voice. Let me hear that, that voice of God communing and dining. And number seven, put, Lord, a fear of the Lord on me. Put a fear of the Lord on me, Lord, that I would fear you and no one else and nothing else. Number eight, I pray that you would just cause my eyes to be fixed upon Jesus and him alone. That my Eyes would not be distracted by a million other things, but Christ would be my focus. And the last thing I want to pray is, Lord, would you give us, just agree with me, I want to ask that God would give us a, a fresh hunger, a fresh hunger for him, a fresh hunger for a revelation of Jesus Christ. That God would give us a fresh hunger for him. Father, would you give us a fresh hunger for Jesus Christ. Lord, would you give us a fresh thirst for Jesus Christ? That we would hunger and thirst for you, Lord, like we have never hungered and thirsted before. Lord, break off complacency, break off apathy, break off indifference, break off lukewarmness, and let our hearts be ignited with passion for your Son. Give us hunger for him. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening, and um, God bless you, and we'll see you next week, and hope you have an awesome week. God bless you.